So I'm, I'm talking to Carol Dweck at the Math Connects conference, and um, in in designing curriculum, trying to build curriculum, working with kids, uh, it, it's it seems to me that psychological issues surrounding the mm -hmm. curriculum are as important as the math itself. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you would, you know, give me your impressions on that. And well, I think jump math already implicitly incorporates a lot of growth mindset principle. Growth mindset is the idea that kids can develop their abilities, their math ability in this case. And jump math just demonstrates that so uh, readily. The kids are moving at an exciting pace. It feels like it should be hard, but it's not hard for them, the way you're teaching it, it's advancing. They all have this feeling of progress, and they all get the feeling, I can be good at this. I can learn to be good at this. So have you seen, uh, in your work, um, you found just by having kids understand that their abilities yes. aren't fixed, that, that their abilities can come out of hard work, yes. persistence, and so on, you found just by teaching them that, um, they tend to do better with no other changes. Yes, it's really amazing. And um, it has a really pronounced effect on their performance in math, in particular, because that's a subject so many kids are afraid of. Uh -huh. And just by teaching them that math is an acquired set of skills, every time they push out of their comfort zone to do hard things, the neurons in their brains form new connections, and over time they can get smarter and smarter. It releases them from this idea, I'm not smart, if I make a mistake it means I'm not smart. It focuses them on learning, on doing hard things, making the mistakes and learning from them, uh, persisting uh, when they have setbacks. And do you think if you combined, if you, and I think you've done some of this work yourself, mm -hmm. but if you combined uh, teaching them to understand how their brains work and teaching them that, that their abilities can develop yes. persistence, with an experience, uh, combine that with, a, with an actual experience of, of feeling that or, or conquering a challenge or, or yes. solving incrementally hard problems, do you think that would, uh, the two approaches together would be fruitful? I think it's an ideal combination. Because you're teaching them this principle, right? They can uh, grow their skills th uh, through learning, and uh, so they can carry that idea around right. with them. But then, the way you teach the math really demonstrates it, makes it real, makes it concrete. Yeah, we've seen in in some inner city schools. Um, I mean, people don't think of math and social justice. They would think, oh, it's too hard for kids. They're not going to get engaged. But mm -hmm. in inner city schools, when kids feel they're capable in math, yes. which is supposed to be a hard subject, yes, we've seen evidence that it spills mm -hmm. over into other subjects and starts to make them think that they can do anything. Yeah. So it's unfortunate, I think, that math has this this reputation yes. of, of being something that's only natural. It's, yes. it's it's a place where I think people have fixed mindsets almost more than any other subject. Yeah, it's true. Actually, it's true. We have data. People think math is more fixed than any other really? subject. Really? Absolutely. But um, it's interesting you talk about social justice because many educators try to make kids feel that they're good in math without making them be right. good in math. Right. And we found in our research that trying to tell kids they're smart, right. even if they've done something really noteworthy, backfires. It makes them think the whole game is about being smart. And next time if I make a mistake, maybe right. they'll think I'm dumb. So we found Praise the process. Right. If they really focus on something, if they really struggle through something and make progress, mm -hmm. if that's they something try I learned from you actually. Strategies. That's what mm -hmm. you praise. That's how the, they're going mm -hmm. to become smarter. Yeah, I, um, I th we. I often tell kids they're smart, and I think mm -hmm. with, with kids who've never heard it, it's good sometimes to hear that, but I learned from you that you've got to be careful that that doesn't become the reward that they, and, yeah. and that they think that their goal is to demonstrate how smart they are, yes. rather than to demonstrate that they're going to persist, yeah. and so on. So that, I've yeah. learned a lot from uh, your, your work that well, way. Thank you. 
So, you know, you can say that's an interesting answer, mm -hmm. um, how'd you get it, or um, yes, you were really focusing. You see, when I liked when you, well, I liked when you said, you look out the window, your brain's out the window. If you're right. focusing here, you're learning that process, right. rather than how the answer reflects on whether they're smart or not. So I, um, it was amazing the response of the teachers to your talk. There was enormous excitement, uh, and it, it's amazing that in an hour you can convey something that could have such an effect on people's teaching. Within an hour you can learn uh, how important it is not to give kids a fixed mindset, mm -hmm. how important it is to encourage their perseverance and not just their mm -hmm. intelligence. So I, I, I think that this seems to be in a time when more and more of the real research that's being done in cognitive science and psychology should be getting into the classroom. Yes. What's your... That's my impression, too. I think, um, finally, in the last 10 years or so, psychology has discovered things that are really important to classroom learning. Mm -hmm. And it seems there's a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of teachers in the 90s and in the early 2000s were told that things like basic facts don't matter so much, knowledge of, of multiplication tables and number sense that mm -hmm. kids could always use a calculator for those kind of things and they're not, not that important. But that's an example where cognitive scientists, I think, are finding that if you don't have basic skills, right. most of your mental space is occupied yeah. trying to remember those things. You have no room left to think. You don't have a framework for right. organizing and also it um, negates the importance of math uh, uh, and conceptual understanding in your life. It says, oh, you know, you don't have to learn this. Later on, you can always use a calculator. Right. No. Wrong. And then that would feed into the <laughs> yeah. fixed mindset, because if you assume you can't learn those things, and those things are so important to conceptual understanding, you just yeah. get proof that when you don't learn them, you, it's yeah. just proof to you that you're not good at it. So and it's kind of a vicious cycle. And they close, it closes off so many options to you. Right. So many uh, careers in science and engineering require mathematical skills. You're not going there if you haven't mastered those skills. So I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've been very generous to, to talk to me. But um, do you have any sort of message for teachers or suggestions about how they could, where they could look or go to, to start learning about some of this research? And I know you don't like to plug your own work, so I'm going to say first that people should read Mindset. It's a, your book, Mindset, is a, is a um, life-changing book. But are, are there places people can go to get more information? Yes. I have a, a website, mm -hmm. mindsetonline, one word, dot com. Mm -hmm. um, the Brainology company called Mindset Works has um, toolkits for mm -hmm. teachers that they can use to implement growth mindset in their classrooms. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much, and it's been an honor having you at the conference. It's been great. Thank you.